Hello, everybody. Hello. Are you ready? Let me see. I'm not a big expert in this software. Hello, everybody. Hello. Let me see how it works. I think you should see me now. Hello? Yeah, I'm still preparing. I see some people joining already. So give me a few seconds. I'll make sure it works. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Yeah, we have some people joining, which is great. So I hope you can see me. I hope you can hear me. It seems to be working. So, uh, so I think that most of you came to the webinar from my blog. So that's how you probably know me, and that's how you probably got interested in my content. So this is the first webinar for me. I'm not really, I'm not really an expert in this thing. So I will, I'm planning to do them uh, every month. So this is the first one. And most of them will be about object-oriented programming and specifically about object thinking, which I think is, is the right way to, to write open object-oriented software. So today is the first time, and uh, I have to say, I have to, like, I have to say before we start is that everything I'm gonna say today is basically my, my personal opinion. So I, I've, heard a lot of, uh, I've heard a lot of answers on my blog, a lot of comments about my, my articles, saying that this is not this is not a science this is not something which the industry actually accepts and i have to say that yes this is personal this is my personal opinion and everything you hear from me is based mostly on my experience uh i don't think that object-oriented programming or oops sorry that's some energy saving in the room <laughs> So I don't think that object-oriented programming is something which, uh, which is a strict science. It's, it's, it's still, it's still uh, a work in progress, and that's why every opinion counts. So mine should be as well. Uh, so the key point today, what I'm trying to express, is that it's going to be about static methods. Static methods and their object-oriented alternatives. So the main, the, main, the main thought, the main idea I would try, I would try to convey is that uh, static methods are really an evil thing in object-oriented programming, and they have to be uh, completely replaced by proper objects. So every time you see a static method, you have to understand, well, we have to understand that something is wrong in the software and it should be refactored. That's the main, that's the main idea. Uh, so the agenda will be, we're going to spend one hour on this, and the agenda is that, first of all, I'll give a little bit about the theory, like why I think so. The second one, I'll give you a practical example of uh, what, how I like, how I, uh, how I faced the problem with the static methods in Java, and how I resolved it myself in one, in one of the open source frameworks I'm working on now. Then uh, I will try to answer a few concerns uh, people expressed on the blog in the comments, and I will try to give the answers to them. Uh, and then I'm, I'm hope, I hope you will have some questions for me and I will be able to answer them. So let's start with the theory. Uh, let me show you first. Let me share a piece of code with you. And I'll explain what the static method is about. 
So here's the, here's the code. The first piece of code, this one, is, well, you, you probably understand what it does. It's like, a, it's a small class which compares uh, two integers and returns the biggest of them. So the class is a pair, and this method returns the biggest value in the pair. It does this by the help of this, it's a Java code, by the help of this static method, this utility class, math, and there's a static method max in this utility class. So I think that this is wrong and this is right. It's exactly, well, almost exactly the same class, but it also encapsulates two numbers and it also returns the biggest of them, but it does it differently. It does it by the instantiation of, uh, of, a, of an object and then it returns an object. Instead of returning a scalar integer here, it returns uh, an object of type of, of interface number. And this object is a maximum between, well, a maximum of these two numbers. So I think, I believe that the first example, this one, is terribly wrong. And this is way better. It's not perfect, the second one. It's not perfect because it still needs refactoring. But the first one is terribly wrong. So why is that? Um, I think that static, let's, let's, get, let's step back a little bit back to, uh, let's try to compare the procedural. This is procedural programming. This is object-oriented. This is more object-oriented. And this is procedural. Why is that? The procedural programming, it's the idea how the software looks in the procedural programming. Uh, the application is a long, uh, a long set of statements which are supposed to be executed one by one, starting from the entry point and finishing at the exit point of the software. This is how C software is designed. You have the main function, and this main function gets control when uh, receives control from the operating system, and then it goes statement by statement till the end. If you write the long main function in C or in assembly or in basic, in all these procedural languages, you will end up with a very long, very long function. They call it functional procedure. Basically, it's a procedure. So it's going to be very long listing, like multiple, many thousands of lines of code. In order to decompose this problem into smaller pieces, they invented procedures, which are basically pieces of code taken aw away from the main function and placed somewhere else and labeled somehow. They call the procedures with the name and parameters. And then you may call them and the execution will go there. They will continue there using the stack. So you pass the parameters into the sub procedure. Then the execution will continue in the sub procedure and then will return back to the main procedure. So you can break down the big scope of, of the problem into procedures and sub-procedures. But still, the entry point of the software is at one point, and then you go through all these statements one by one. You continue to execute till the software ends, till the end of the, till the, end of the application or script execution. This is how, this is how the procedural programming is, 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 uh, uh, is actually, let me stop this. You can see me again. So this is how the procedural programming is uh, intended to, to decompose the problem into pieces. And, and that was, that, was that, de that decomposition method actually has problems. And uh, that's why object-oriented programming was invented. Because if you decompose that way, you will end up with a software which is very unmaintainable and difficult to uh, difficult to extend and difficult to uh, uh, to refactor or to 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 add some features on to fix the bugs because every time you're basically dealing with uh, with a long with the, the scope is still big and you always you're always uh, managing the uh, the data which goes through all these procedures deeper and deeper into into uh, smaller procedures. So I, basically, it was difficult to maintain this kind of software. That's why object-oriented programming was invented. In the object-oriented programming, the de de to decompose the problem into pieces, you you do it completely different. You uh, you break down you, you 
present your whole software as a big one object, which is composed into, which, com which encapsulates smaller objects inside, and you wire these objects one to another, uh, mostly through constructors, not through functions, not through method calls. So the entry point to the procedure, to the entry point to the procedure is actually this, this function or procedure, which is the, the data which comes in and then the amount of statements. But with the object, the, the, the entrance, the entry point of the object is a constructor. So in OP, when you design the software, you break down the problem into smaller elements, which are objects, and then you wire them together through constructors. So you allow one big object to encapsulate multiple other objects, and these smaller objects also encapsulate smaller objects through constructors. So in OP, the functions are small, really small, like a few lines of code, but the constructors are, well, the constructors, the objects, they have more constructors and small and, and less functions. So the, the, decomposition, the decomposition problem in procedural programming is different from decomposition in, in, in object-rendered programming. That's the key difference. In the code which I've showed you just before, let me show it again. Yeah, in this code, when you use the static function, uh, the, existence, the existence of this function actually encourages you to turn this function also into a static function. And then remove these two things and put them here. So that's where you, your software will get. If you, if you keep using static functions and you keep liking them and you keep uh, uh, appreciating them. So eventually, it's like, it's like a cancer in the object-oriented programming. It will eventually cover your entire code base. Eventually, all of your functions will be static because you will see no point in encapsulating anything because this is way faster. This is less lines of code. It's going to work faster. And it will look for you, if you think in a procedural way, it will look for you like a perfect procedure from a C style, from, from, from the way you decompose the problem in procedural programming. So this will look like a perfect uh, design for you. And then, and then you will eventually turn your, your pair class into a utility class, which will have only static functions. And then everybody who actually is using this pair class will also think like, why do we need this to be a class? Why do we need to make an object of this class? We can just make call this a static function. And then for, for me, if I'm a client of this function, of this object, sorry, of this class, then I also don't want to have the, uh, the proper object. I can use only static methods. So if you go that way, if you keep using static, static, static methods, public static methods, then your whole software, your entire object-oriented software, which will, will become not an object-oriented, but a software with a procedural decomposition. So you will actually get back to C programming in a Java syntax. You will have the Java libraries. You will have the, uh, the Java syntax, all this you know, Java uh, convenience, which is Java is way more convenient than C. But, but the code will look that the design will be perfectly, will be purely procedural in a C way, in an assembly way, in a basic way. So that's my point. Maybe, maybe it's a little bit too theoretical. Maybe it's really, really too, too abstract. But this is, the main, this is the main idea which I'm trying to convey. So the static functions, they are actually static methods, public static methods. They encourage us as programmers to think in a procedural way and decompose our, uh, our scope, our bigger problem, into pieces, into, into procedures, not into objects. Not into, like in this example, not into, into small living organisms, like I call them on the blog, uh, which, which encapsulate other living organisms. And then uh, they, uh, they, they expose the behavior and expose probably other objects through some methods. And also, uh, if you, this also like static methods, this, the, the way that you compose into procedural way, is uh, also will encourage you to use a lot of debugging. 
So if you if you use debugging, if you use this thing like going through statement by statement deeper and deeper into functions and static methods, uh, if you use this debugging feature in the in the your uh, IDE, this means that uh, that you're doing something wrong. It means that you're in a procedural world still, because in the object oriented world you don't use debugging. At, well, you don't use debugging at all, because all your objects are quite small. They're really small. And all you need to test them, and all, all you need to, to make sure they work is to write a small unit test for a small object and, uh, and see how the object behaves in a unit test. You don't need to go deeper and deeper in, in a procedural way, in a, in, a, in a flow control execution way. I don't know how to call it, but if you, if you really need to go through function to function, going deeper and deeper in stack, and seeing how data goes through through functions to functions, that means that you are working in a C world, in an assembly world, not in object-oriented world. So that's what I wanted to say. So there are basically two different types of thinking, procedural versus object-oriented. And when you use static methods, you are uh, basically going back to, to procedural programming, even though you're in Java or Ruby syntax. Ruby is saying that uh, they, it's an object-oriented language, but the, the language, it is object-oriented, but the libraries they provide, the standard libraries from Ruby, they are full of the static uh, utility classes, uh, the utility classes with static methods, and they encourage Ruby programmers to, to design and, and develop a procedural uh, software, not object-oriented. I believe it's, it's wrong. So this is, this is enough about the theory. I, I hope I gave you the idea. So let me show you now the practical example of what I've, stumbled upon in one of the frameworks I'm working on right now and this is what I this is what I, this is again it's a Java so this is what I was trying to achieve so I was doing it's a you, you probably understand the code so I was trying to find something somewhere and if nothing is found then I'm trying to return it's gonna be return here return so I was trying to return the, the instance of an iterable uh, which Instead of doing like this, instead of doing like this, I I want to return an array, an, a list, an iterable actually, which uh, if somebody will try to get some elements from it, then it shouldn't throw just a standard exception like no items found with no description, but it has to throw a more meaningful exception which will actually say why there is nothing in the array. So in order to do this, I created this decorator, which is called uh, verbose iterable. So it encapsulates the original list, which has nothing inside. And it also encapsulates the message, the message for the exception, which will be thrown, which will be erased, if somebody will try to basically do something like this. If you try, if you get the iterable from here, and then you try to do this, then this exception will be thrown, which will be which will look nicer for you as a as a user of this of this iterable. Instead of like no items found or nor nor no such key here, uh, you get the, the full description of why there is nothing in there. What's wrong with this code? There's one thing which is wrong. This is this is how I can do it because this is what Java gives me. The Java gives me a static function. This is the, the static, the pure utility function format from the string class. And this function, this is the only thing I have in Java. So in order to build this message and use the parameters inside the message, I have to use this function. What's wrong about it? What's wrong about it is that if I return an iterable and the client will just get an iterable and will never do anything with it, still this function is called. Still, the message is built. So the message and uh, this concatenation of strings and building the strings and putting all these parameters in here and actually building the text, the composition of the text is still in place. So no matter what will happen with the iterable later, still in this part of the code, when I'm building the iterable, I'm gonna build the full string. So I'm gonna create it. I'm gonna. So it's, it's a performance problem because I'm going to call this function, it will be called, it's going to be, this one function will be called, and then all of these results of these functions will be injected into the string and the string will be composed. 
So it will take some time. And every time the client actually gets an iterable, this execution will be done again and again. And I can't go around it. I can't do anything about it because this is the static function. So basically Java is asking me to execute everything right here, to build the string right here. I cannot delay this execution. I cannot uh, make an object which behaves like a properly formatted string and give this object to my verbose iterable. I can't do it in Java. I have to, to do the procedural way. I have to call the function format. I have to get the result from this function. And then I can use it as a string, as a parameter to verbose iterable. This is, this is not the way you think in object-oriented programming. You, this is not how you want to do it. You don't want to execute everything right here. You want, to com you want to compose an object, this one. You want to compose it from smaller objects and then let it live its own life. So this is how I refactored it. This is my refactoring. So instead of string format, I created new class and I called it addsprintf. This new class is accepting two parameters. The first parameter is, it's a constructor. So the constructor of this class is accepting the parameter, which is the, the pattern of the string to, to, to build, and then the elements which, needs to be, which need to be injected into the string. The rest is the same. So now if somebody is actually, if my client is getting this iterable, and does nothing with it, the string will not be built because, because the, nothing will be called from the verbose iterable. The verbose iterable will not receive the control. And this object will not receive the control either. So it's not going to execute the composition. It will, not actually, it will not actually perform any activity. It will just sit tight, silent, quiet, holding this data, encapsulating the data as properties inside, inside the object and doing nothing until somebody actually asks the object to act. So look how it looks now. New, new, new. So I'm not telling the software what to do. I'm just composing the software from uh, using just constructors. This is the call to constructor. This is a call to constructor. This is a call to constructor. No, this is, these are function calls, the method calls, yes. But again, if we go further and we continue to refactor and refactor, we will replace this stuff as well with the with the mat, with the constructors called calls with the calls to constructors. So here, this is the functional approach. This is the procedural approach. We call the procedure right here. We go to this procedure using the stack. We pass the data in the procedure. We expect the result, and then we use this result in order to potentially call another procedure. But yeah, here we are calling the constructor. This is good. But in this case, we're just calling the constructors. We just construct objects. We compose objects into objects and into objects. And then again, return the object, which behaves the way it should behave. So this is the practical example. I, I've done it and I introduced this class and it actually helps me to solve the performance problem. Because here, my problem was with the performance. Because I don't want to, to run all this stuff every time, every time my, my iterable is constructed. So this is the, that was the practical example. And now let me address three main concerns people actually expressed on the blogs. And I think it's, it's worth uh, mentioning them uh, and talk about them. So the first one is performance. That's the biggest, the biggest concern I've heard in to almost all of my articles. The performance. Uh, most of the people say that this call is way faster in Java, for example, or in actually in many languages. Than, than, than that one. Because here we actually instantiate an object. We make an object, we allocate some, some space in memory. We create, well, first of all, we allocate the space in memory. And second, when the, actually the call will be made to this object, when eventually uh, something like this will happen, then this call should go through the virtual table of the object, which will be a little bit slower than this particular call. So this one is the fastest way in Java, or in, for example, C++, is the fastest way to call some piece of code from somewhere. And actually, if you look at the Android, uh, perform Android uh, design kind of uh, best practices or manual official one, it says that they encourage 
Android developers, they encourage you, they, they ask you to do it like this. They like specifically say that static methods are good and making new objects should be avoided as, as much as possible. My answer to this is that in general, I think, well, this is the valid concern, but I think that in general, uh, the performance, especially in modern software and in modern hardware, the performance, the speed of execution is uh, way less important than the speed of and the cost of uh, the maintenance of the software. So if, uh, let me stop this thing. So the maintenance problem, maintenance means how much time and how much money uh, we have to invest into uh, into changing the, the product we have, into changing this this these lines of code. Uh, the amount of money and time we spend on this, the amount of money basically, is way more, is way bigger than the amount of money a new server or a new chip or a new CPU will cost us. In case of Android, I understand that this is maybe not exactly right at the moment. Like if I would say the same 10 years ago about, about hardware, about the, 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 the desktop computers, the, the personal computers, that would, be, that would be not true as well. But that was 10 years ago. Now, we don't have the performance problems. The performance problem is not as critical right now as the problem of maintenance. The cost of development, the cost of, of maintaining this, this, the software we write is way more important than just the cost of a new server. For the Android specifically, this is not the case now because these uh, mobile phones, they are uh, still quite slow and they have pretty limited amount of hardware inside. But let's think for the future and let's blame the Android developers, not the object-oriented programming. So they, as Android developers, they are, they, well, not specifically Android, but mobile developers and developers of this hardware, instead of improving the, 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 the Java platform for the Android, instead of uh, trying to make it more, uh, more welcoming towards the OOP practices, the proper OOP practices, like, norm, like objects creating and constructing them, and like what I just explained, instead of that, they're looking backward and saying, how about we develop the C software instead of Java software, instead of OOP software, because this is faster. So instead of making their lives more complex and instead of focusing on, if, on improving what they have and improving their, their design, they're asking us to develop software the way we've done it 20 years ago. So I think this is conceptually wrong. So we shouldn't, well, in some situations, of course, it's not black and white. In some specific situations, when you see a performance bottleneck and you definitely need to use static method, which I haven't seen in my life, these situations. I haven't seen the performance bottleneck specifically because of making objects instead of calling static methods. But maybe some of you have seen this problem. But in this case, yes, of course, we sometimes we are forced to use the static methods. But I strongly believe this is not, this may not be the, the bottleneck in performance. That's my answer to this concern. The second problem was, was mentioned is that, uh, again, on the blog, people saying that, uh, you know what? This making new objects, it's not possible in Java because, for example, uh, a string class is final. So you cannot make, like in, in my example, like I make this asprintf uh, class, and in my example, it's, it extends, not the st it, it implements not the string, because string is a final class, and it implements the, the, another interface, which also the string implements. But something we cannot do, for example, arrays. You cannot in Java make an object which behaves like an array or so so it's not possible so you need to like call some function to build an array for you and then they return this array so you cannot make an object instead of array in java or you cannot make an object instead of a scalar whale value like integer or float or boolean for example so they are scalar uh objects in java and this is what java has so we cannot use objects everywhere we eventually have to use something which is not an object, for example, in Java. And, and that's, that's why the static methods may be helpful. For example, this uh, calculating the maximum between the two integers, that will be, fast, that, that they, that will be faster. And it's not possible to make it uh, object-oriented like I showed you, like I just showed in the example, because of Java limitations. 
my answer here is that uh, yes, Java is not perfect. Java is not an object-oriented language. It's not a pure object-oriented language. It was basically uh, inherited from, it inherited a lot of stuff from C and C++, mostly because I think they wanted to, uh, to encourage uh, C and C++ developers to use Java because that time everybody, well, a lot of people were actually writing in C and C++ and it's 20 years ago. And it was necessary to, to give them something, some new language, which they would be able to, uh, to adapt and to use immediately. And that's why Java started. And, and that's why Java, for example, inherited this main function, which is a static function which is the, like, this is really, according to what I've just explained, this main function, the static, public static function, is really a bad idea because, but it was inherited from C. C as well has the main function, the, the function called main. So Java did exactly the same instead of making it proper OP way. And why did it happen? It's historical reasons. But I think that if we, if we re remove and close our eyes on the, on the stuff which is not perfect in Java and use what is perfect, what is good, because Java is a powerful language and it has all the necessary uh, OOP uh, tools and techniques inside. But it also has something which, which doesn't look like OOP, for example, like public static methods or uh, like scalar types, like integer, boolean, and float and everything. Or for example, the string type, the string class is final which is also kind of strange. So all these limitations, they are, uh, we can close our eyes on that and try to develop our code, our software, better than, than, than what Java is suggesting us. And uh, th that's my understanding. So we shouldn't code in, in pure Java. We shouldn't just, uh, just be stuck on the practices which Java is offering us for 20 years because some of these practices and Many of them are simply wrong because I think, again, for historical reasons, they were basically, uh, they were brought to Java world from C and assembly world, from procedural world. It happened 20 years ago. And that time it was reasonable, probably. But now it, ha it makes no sense. So now we should, well, we have them. We still have them. We still have the stuff which actually was introduced 20 years ago. The same in many other languages. Ruby, Python, PHP, they all started long, long time ago when actually procedural programming was the way people were developing stuff. And, but we should stop doing that because the procedural programming is way less effective. It's not effective. It's not really productive and it's not maintainable. It doesn't produce maintainable code comparing to what, what object-oriented can offer. So the answer here is even though, even though uh, we have uh, the stuff which limits us in using proper objects instead, instead of static methods, we have to try. We have to try to do it as much as possible. And I created, well, I created about a month ago a framework, a web framework, which uh, I, I, that was my idea to actually prove to myself and, and to people who work with me that uh, actually it's possible to, uh, to build something decent and something, well, reasonably big uh, without using any of this uh, any of these anti-patterns from, uh, from procedural programming in, in Java. And I managed to do this. So this framework, it has like uh, 15,000 lines of code. It has about 100 classes and it has no pu public static methods. And it has, oops, sorry. And it has uh, no public static methods and it has no, uh, none of this stuff, which I, I believe was inherited from, from, C, from C, from C language long time ago. So the answer here is that yes, lim Java has limitations, but we can work with that. We, we can find workarounds and don't use the stuff which is, which, which is not good in Java or in many other languages. And one more thing, one more concern, and then we'll try to go to question and answer sessions. I hope you will have some questions. So uh, that's the concern I've heard in the blog uh, recently. Some people said like, hey, uh, Java is not perfect, and that's the way it is, and there is no reason to be, to try to be a pure, to try to write pure object-oriented software, like using all these uh, puristic uh, OOP ideas, 
because the Java is not perfect and we have a lot of software in Java or in Ruby or in other languages, they are not perfect. And, and not just they are not perfect, not just the platform is not perfect, but people over the last 20 years, they created libraries. Hello. I think my Chrome, my Chrome just just canceled. Okay. Uh, I hope you can see me. So um, where I was? Yes. Yeah, so what's the point? That's the question. Like, what's the point of uh, of using uh, of using Java of of trying to um, to write the software against uh, the principles and practices which were which we're using for twenty years? Look, for example, and uh, and Guava library. This Guava library is very popular in Java world, and it's coming from Google, a respected company. And this library is used by everybody, and it's full of static, public static methods. Actually, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it is based on them. So this is the practices which, are, uh, which Google is trying to, to teach us. So the Google is actually telling us, like, this is, this is right. This is the way you should develop the software. Or look at the Apache Commons. Apache Commons, this file utils, string utils, I/O utils, they they are in the market for for years, and they are they basically are like they consist mainly of static of public static functions, which are procedures. So they are basically giving us a collection, a huge collection of procedures, and we are supposed to call them from our procedures, and then our procedures are being called from our procedures. So they want us to design our software, to decompose our software into procedures and stay in the C world. So the question is, like, if the whole market, if the industry is actually is actually pushing us this direction, like, why do we need to to go against the current and and try to be pure object oriented and try to design this small small like small composable objects which have a lot of constructors just a few methods all these constructors they, they they encapsulate one another and then it's it will not look like the software you would find in open source world you will be you'll be thinking differently from from what guava is thinking from what apache is thinking so my answer is this is this is a valid concern and i understand it my answer is that um, is that I think it's it's time to change. I think that uh, again, maybe probably because of uh, the hardware world is changing, computers are becoming becoming faster, and uh, people are becoming more expensive. So the, the total cost of ownership of a software uh, now consists of ninety percent. 90% of total cost of ownership belongs to people, like our salaries, and only maybe 10%, maybe less, actually goes to the hardware. And that was not the case 10 years ago. 20 years ago, it was completely different. 20 years ago, it was a small portion was going to, to, to the salaries, and a lot of money was spent on hardware. Now this, this balance is shifting towards the, the expenses which, goes, which go to us, the people. And I think it's an, an Apache and Guava and all these libraries, all this static, all this static uh, stuff was actually developed uh, a long time ago. They started to develop it a long time ago when it was important to focus on performance instead of on performance, instead of focusing on maintainability and readability of your code and actually, you know, uh, the clear the clearness of the design. So I think I believe it's time to change. It's time to change the way we think and it's time to change the libraries we use. These Apache Commons and Guava, they're not forever. It's time to, to think about something new. It's time to introduce something new, and, and it should start somewhere. So I believe that, that in the software I write and in the software in commercial as well, I'm trying to, uh, uh, to preach the practices I've just explained, the, the practices of pure object-oriented programming. And I believe the whole industry is actually trying to, 
it's not just me. It's not just me saying about that. There are many other people writing about that and, and, and mentioning this problem. So I think it's time for all of us to change and, and improve and start writing the software for us, not for computers. So the software should be written the way we people understand it. That's the most important thing, not the computers. The computers will understand it. That's, that's the second step. The computers will understand it. It will happen. But what's most important is that we, me, my friend, my another friend, the, the, my customer, my user, my, the user of my open source library, they all understand the code I write. Not just the, the computer which runs my code, but first of all, people should understand it because people consume most of the costs of maintenance of the software. Most of the money uh, project sponsors spend, they go to our pockets, not to the computer, not to the hardware. The hardware, they, it is really cheap right now. It's way cheaper than it was before. So we start to, we start to change and we start to develop software which, which is object-oriented because object-oriented is way more effective way to decompose a bigger problem into smaller pieces. So that's, that's what I wanted to say. So now if you have questions, you can, you can post them. Yes, there was a question, is there recording? Yes, we'll have this stuff on, on YouTube. So you will see, you will see the, I will post it later on the blog. So if you have any questions, you can ask me. There's a, there's a section for questions, you can post them there. And I see them. In the meantime, while you're thinking on the questions, I have one question which I also wanted to address. It's about the, uh, let me check, let me check my records. Yeah, I had this like, on one of my articles, I had this comment. Somebody said that uh, that you're like you're suggesting to use uh, small, uh, small, 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 small methods. But uh, oh, let me let me check. You have some questions here, so maybe I'll answer your questions first. Um, so let me read the question. Where I work. Uh, where I work, a lot of there is a lot of factory classes which have static methods. Yes, I want to refactor this. Should I simply make the factories non-static, or should I look to remove the factories and improve the constructors of the classes? The factory is instantiating. Uh, yeah, that's that's a valid question. So what what do we where do we go from here? Like for example, we have this a lot of static methods, and we want to improve the software. We want to fix it. So what's the first step? I think that. The, the easiest step to, to start going there, it's not, it's not the final step, but this is the first step, is take the static method and create a small object which does exactly the same, which this method does, but all the parameters, all the arguments which you pass to the static method, make them parameters of the constructor of the object. That's the first step. It's not going to solve the big problem, but you will start somewhere. So, for example, if you look at the file utils or IO utils from Apache, you will see that there is a like a huge file. They have like 50 different methods or 100 different methods, static methods. So there should be 50 different classes. That's what I think. That's going to be the first step. As soon as you have these 50 different classes, you will think like, what's the, what's the, what do they have in common? This class and that one, I extracted them from, I converted the static methods into classes. So what do we have in common in this class? And then you will see, okay, there's an interface. And, and these two classes, they have to, they implement the same interface. That's how you go. Um, yeah, another question, I think it should probably go in, in, in oops. Sorry about that, that's uh, energy savings in the room. Um, Factories, another question. Uh, factories are also static methods, like uh, new array lists in Guava and many of them, yeah. Uh, such methods improve readability and maintainability dramatically. Compare and uh, improve readability and maintainability. Yeah, that's a, que that, that's a good question. People, I've heard it on blog as well. People saying, like, we are used to these static methods, and they are very readable. 
We can easily understand what they do because we just call a method, which is a procedure, and this procedure builds something for us, and then we can use it. Just like I showed you before with the string.format. This is just a matter of habit. We just used to procedural programming. We just used to think like procedures, they do something for us. We give them the data, we give the data to the procedure, and procedure returns the result to us. This is the way computers work. This is not how we should work. This is not how we should think. So the object thinking is different from computer thinking. So they look to you, they look to you more readable because you're used to that. You used to think like I give you some data and you give me the result back. This is this is the way procedures work, but objects work differently. In the works, this is not object oriented in object thinking, it's different. I give you the data and you give me yourself back. You don't give me the data back. I just construct you and the way I get the what, what I get back is an object, and the object behaves like something I expect. So if I want uh, to make a list, then I call a constructor of the list, and then the list is here, and it and it and it and it, and it exists for me. It works for me. So static methods are it's just it's just a way of thinking. You should just change the way you think. Uh, so yeah, how do I? Yeah, I should click select probably. Yeah. Currently answering. Uh -huh. So here's the question. Uh, loggers are generally always static, including my own library. Yes. How do you feel loggers should be implemented? Um, that's a good question. Again, it's a, it's a constraint. It's, it's the way we have. This is what we have in Java. So I think that in, ideally, in the, in, ideally, the platform, be it Java, Ruby, or whatever, uh, has to give us the ability to to implement logging a different way not the way we have now because well if you if you if we try to think in an object way then every logger has to be a property of an object and it has to be passed to the constructor and has to be encapsulated in the object that would be the, the ideal way but in this case we'll create a lot of noise in the code because every class, every object will accept a logger inside, will expect a logger to, to, be, uh, to be encapsulated, and every constructor will have an extra parameter with the logger. And this is, not, this is, not, this is just a noise for the application. So the, the platform has to, be, has to offer some, some, uh, some, some mechanisms for a better logging. So preferably, like, Preferably, uh, yeah, it has to be implemented in the platform. It has to be in the language. But Java doesn't have it. Ruby doesn't have it. All of them, they have like third-party libraries which you use for logging. But I think this is conceptually wrong. The logging should be part of the platform itself. Like logging or um, there, there are many, there are a few things which, which need to be in the language. Like we have, uh, for example, um, what do we have in the language? Like uh, we have in the language the... Uh, the arithmetic operators. So you can compare A to B and say who is bigger, A or B. You don't need uh, you don't need an object for that. You not you don't need a compare a comparator or some you know mathematical engine to compare number five to number six. You just use an operator, which is more or less. So this is provided to you by the plat by the language itself. The same should be for the logger. The same should be for some concepts which need to exist in the language. But we don't have it in Java, and I, I, I'm not aware of any language which has that. So ideally, that's how it should be. But until then, we can use static methods. Yes, this is, this is the workaround, so we use them. But another question. What do you think of Scholar as a more object-oriented Java? It doesn't have static methods. Uh, I, I'm not, I tried Scholar for, for like, for one of the for one project about half a year ago, and uh, and I I can say I'm an expert there. I don't really like know language that well, but it looks to me like uh, they actually implemented a lot of things before Java eight, and at the moment we have most of them in Java eight. So there is actually I think that Scala is maybe I'm wrong. Don't don't. I'm not an expert, but it looks to me like J like Scala was uh, a little bit ahead of Java 8, and they introduced a lot of stuff which we don't really need right now. In Scala, we can use it in Java 8. 
but as long as as long as they don't have static methods then i definitely think it's 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 a better way better way better object oriented uh, language than than java of course but but if you use scala you're kind of well maybe not I'm, i was i was planning to say that you're limited to the uh, you, you don't you can't use all the stuff from Java, but this is not true So you can use the, the libraries and everything from Java in the Scala world. So yes, if you if you prefer Scala then Then go for it, but but I think Java is a rather popular language and it's easier to find developers in Java It's easier to maintain the code as long as we have more developers and they are because of that, their uh, the, the costs of maintenance will be lower. So I don't think that uh, I think that we can just uh, stop using static methods in Java and continue to stay in Java. Also, because we have Java eight, so Java is developing. Java is a huge world. Java is a huge environment. The huge uh, uh, how do you call it? The huge community and uh, ecosystem. So I don't think it's necessary to jump out of this into Scala just because there is no static methods. So we can use Java, but stop using static methods. That's what I think. You promote co code for us, the developers. Why do you shortening your class names so much? I don't understand what TK4 is in your web framework, for example. What do you, this is the question. What do you think about DDD that's very big in .NET, for example? Uh, the, the shorting the class names is mostly because I think that the class names, it's a good question. I think that each class has to, the name of the class has to be uh, a noun, like a table, a, a chair, or a glass of water, or it's, it has to be one word, ideally which says what it is. Uh, so it ha if it's, if it's a, a request or an HTTP request or a response, it has to be request or response. If it's, uh, uh, if it's for example, a collection of uh, HTTP headers, then the name of the class should be headers. That's, that's what I would do ideally. But it's not possible because you will have collisions between names. Because the, uh, when you create a class, when you write the code in Java, you sometimes need to use a table from this package and a table from this package, a glass of water from that package and a glass of water from here. And they will, the names will clash. You can have glass and glass at the same. Well, you will have to specify them longer. You will have to give the longer name with the package. You will have to give prefixes. And that's why calling glass 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 in all packages will create will make the code less reusable and uh, and then developers will will not respect will not like it that much but at the same time like spring for example is doing making the long names of the classes like glass of water for http requests this is wrong because this creates this puts a lot of semantic into the class name which is wrong the class should not explain what it does internally. It should it should it should say just what it provides, instead of saying what's in, what's implemented inside the class. It just has to say what do you what you as a client get from me. So this is a glass of water. So you get the water. That's it. Whether I get this water from uh, from from the bottle or from from the from the sink, it doesn't matter. So it has to be a water. So, especially for interface names, I'm, I'm talking more about interfaces now, not, not just classes. So, if it's a, it's a glass, then it's a glass. So, that's why, I, that's why in, the, in the framework, in the takes framework, I introduced these two-letter prefixes, which actually uh, you put the, the prefix two letters in front of the class name and then the actual class name. So, the prefix actually tells you what's the, what is the interface the class has implemented. So that will be glass and then water. So it's a glass of water. So the, for the glass, you put like GS, for example, as a prefix, and then you put the water. So that's, the con that's just the, oops, sorry. I'm trying to save energy here. So, so that's how I named the classes. Maybe, I, I don't think it's, it's well, I think it's, it's good, because I tried many, many naming conventions, and this particular one sounds good to me. 
what I think about DDD. So DDD is domain-driven design, as far as I know, and uh, it's very big in .NET. I'm not really writing anything in .NET, so I can't say anything about .NET, uh, but uh, domain-driven design, uh, I think it's good. I'm not actually an expert in that thing. Uh, I just, I've just heard what it is. Uh, I think it's good. I, I, can't, I can't really answer this question. I, I'm not an expert. Mm, this is done. This one. Yeah, we talked about that already. Doesn't you struggle in creating names in, for so many classes? Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's a, I do struggle. That's a good question. But I think that this is, this is what you should spend most of your time for is actually thinking about how you name your classes and how you decompose the problem into smaller classes. So you have, yes, you have many classes. You need to have many classes. This is, this is how your good software should look like. You should have many, many, many classes, and each class has to be very small. So the smaller the class and the more of them you have, the better is your software. That's what I think. And in every class, uh, you should have a very small amount of methods, ideally less than two, or less to one or two. If you have three methods in a the class, there is something is probably wrong. If you have four, there's definitely something wrong. But you should have many constructors. That's, I, am, I think, what the, the perfect object-oriented design should look like. Many constructors and just one or two methods in the class. And then many classes of this, of this kind. So every time you construct a class, you, you can provide different inputs to the class. You can provide in different inputs for the constructor, like encapsulate this or encapsulate that. And the class is like flexible in accepting this data. But then it exposes the behavior in only very limited way, one or two methods. So when you try, when you start thinking about how to make names for these classes, then definitely it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be a problem. But when this problem is solved, then you then you actually manage to decompose the, pro, the the big scope into smaller pieces, and then the rest is just technical. The implementation of these small classes will be fast and 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 will take no time, because your functions will be small. You just write them in a second. Everything will be clear. So the most of the time for the developer should be should be spent on thinking about how to break down the problem into into subclasses, into classes and objects. Uh, when did you realize? Uh, yeah, so this is done. We have five minutes to, to the end. So when did you realize that coding this way is the right way? What convinced you that almost everybody else, like open source world, are doing it wrong? What is object thinking book from David West? Uh, I think that, yes, the, the, most, the most of the inspiration I got from the book, from, Dave, from David uh, West book, uh, it's called Object Thinking. It's a really good book. But it's very abstract, so it, it doesn't give you code examples. It doesn't show you how to do it in Java or Ruby or anywhere else. It just talks about uh, the, way, the way you should change your thinking. It talks about how you should, you or anybody else, should change. Because before that book and many years before, I was writing procedural programmer. I was writing in C for years. I was writing in C++. I was writing in assembly a long time ago. And then I was writing in Java, the same, the same wrong stuff which, which this Guava and Apache Commons are offering us, the same, the same static methods, the same decomposition and procedural way. I was doing exactly the same. So I think it's not just a book, but it's a combination of practice, because I write a lot of software myself, and the combination of uh, actually practicing this stuff and also thinking about uh, how to uh, to make your life easier and to basically to to spend less time on maintain on on maintenance and debugging and, and bug fixing and actually enjoying uh, making the software and writing the software and and building the software not coding but building the software it's different things so I think that I I, I read this book about three years ago I think. And I read it many, many times after that. And it starts on the first page, on one of the first pages, it says that uh, if you're thinking like a procedural programming, there's almost no way you can become object-oriented programming. Almost no way. That's what the book says. So it's really difficult. It's really a change in the mindset. So yes, the book actually changed, uh, well, helped me a lot. Uh, is CDI compatible with supporting your theory? Um, 
That's the question. Uh, CDI. Um, as far as I understand, CDI, it's the container of dependency injection or something. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a from Java, the technology, yeah, for dependency injection. Uh, I, I think that this, I have an article about this, about this dependency injection. I think that dependency injection is actually, it's just a name for, uh, for proper object design. So there is no technology behind. Well, there is no like innovation behind it. It's just obvious. This is how it should be, but there is a name for it. It's it's called dependency injection. But the the the, the just the constructor it's already there. So we have constructors in Java in C plus plus. So just use the constructors and you will get the dependency injection. So dependency injection is more like a practice, more like a suggestion to everybody. Like uh, stop. Uh, Stop making objects, stop making, start hardwiring your uh, functions or methods to methods and calling them directly. Instead, uh, start to encapsulate objects inside objects. So this is exactly what I was talking about for an hour. So this is exactly what I'm saying. There is no theory about it. Like you're saying, is, is CDI compatible supporting your theory? I don't have any theory. It's just, it's just uh, I'm just talking about, uh, things which were not invented by myself. This is the object oriented how I think it was invented a long time ago. So I'm just trying to I'm just trying to show that what we are doing now, what the practices, the actual software we write, is against the OP ideas. So I'm not I don't have any like specific theory which is mine. This is not mine. Uh, the same for CDI. So the CDI or dependency injection is not something which were which was invented. It's just a it's just the practices which are uh, basically, they're, they're just good, but there is nothing specifically there, nothing unique. And CDI, it's, yes, that's, that's a Java standard with the annotations where you uh, annotate your, um, your, uh, yeah, your properties in, a, in an object, and then you have the, the container, and then when you start an object, uh, these properties will be automatically injected. That's right. I think this is wrong. I think this is wrong. I think that it's a bad idea. I think that object has to be instantiated by the new operator and all the dependencies should be injected into the constructor. So, and it, and it has to be absolutely explicitly visible for the developer. Why? Because like I said, 90% of the time, the developer has to spend on actually thinking about how to decompose the problem into small objects. So it shouldn't be something behind the scene. It should be visible to everybody. And this is, this is the key part of the software. This is the key thing in the application, not the procedures we write, not this algorithmic work we put in our procedures, but actually the way we compose objects using the new operator. And hiding this and letting some constructor to do this for us and then focusing on procedures and focusing on writing this, this long, long, many, many lines uh, functions or static methods, that's the wrong direction. Instead, our methods should be short and the way we compose objects should be long. So when we build an object, we use new operators, new, new, new. We construct an object. We make it big. And then when we start executing it, the execution goes into the object. And the object is small. It's really small. There's a few lines of code. You just run it and return back. So we shouldn't focus here. We shouldn't put our focus here. We should put our focus here on the construction of the object, of how we build a composition, a, a, a complex object from smaller objects. That's what I think. Uh, the next one. Uh, Java 8 lambdas promote passing behaviors between objects. How does this fit with O approach of encapsulating behavior within an object? Um, yeah, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Uh, Java 8 is actually bringing functional programming, like real functional programming, like in Lisp, to the Java world. Is it good? I think it is. Is it object-oriented? I think it has nothing to do with object-oriented programming. It's just two different programming uh, practices. Like, for example, AOP, aspect-oriented -orient programming, which is also a completely different thing from object-oriented programming. The same for functional programming. So now we have, in Java 8, we have functional programming and we have uh, object-oriented programming. They, can, they, they, they don't actually intersect anyhow. 
Because in functional programming, you, oops, sorry. In functional programming, you, uh, you make a function, and then you can, um, you can, you make a, uh, you can you can use the function as a first class citizen. So you can pass the function somewhere. You can use it like like you use a number. So you have number five, and you can pass the number five as an argument to then to the other function, to another method. You can store this number five in a property. You can do something with this number. The same in functional programming. You just use you just have a function which can be used as a as something as some entity which you can pass here and there. This is good because this is this is the functional. This is what functional programming is about. But it has nothing to do with with object oriented. They just do not intersect. So I think it's it's good to use that stuff because it's it's convenient in Java eight. It's really convenient, but it's uh, if it's it's different. It's different. And uh, if you, I I still think that the the best maybe for me the best way to decompose the problem into smaller elements is by using OOP. It's by using objects. And encapsulating objects inside objects. Functional programming, I'm not an expert in this, but I believe that using functional programming properly can also help you to decompose the problem into smaller pieces. Can you combine them together? I think you can. If you're an expert in functional programming, if you understand OOP, you can use them together at the same time. Brilliant. But it's different things. Have you tried other languages? Is Java the best OOP language? Out there, uh, well, I tried, uh, I tried Ruby, I tried Python, I tried PHP, the five, I tried C plus plus, obviously. Uh, that's that's what I know, and I think in all these languages I just mentioned, uh, I tried Scala a little bit. I think for me Java is the best because it has all the features which are required to write a simple and object oriented software, simple. Because C++ is too complex. C++ gives you more than you actually need to write the software, which is understandable, useful, and it, which works. Uh, C++ gives you too many, I think, OOP features, which some of them are not really OOP. Well, some of them are good, some of them are not good. So they have, they have you more power. Ruby and Python, they give you less power. They don't give you something which you need in object-oriented programming. For example, you don't have interfaces in Ruby. Uh, so there is no way, I think, th this is the important feature in OOP. So Ruby is not strong enough. And in Python, there is also something missing. I think some something was missing there. I don't remember. But there are some features which actually you don't have in, 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 in these languages. And Java is somewhere in the middle. So Java is not as complex as C++, and it's not as simple as Ruby or Python or PHP. And Java has a huge ecosystem, the biggest one. So Java has a lot of libraries and a lot of developers and a lot of code already written. So this is, I think, the perfect object-oriented language now is Java. And I don't think it's going to be forever. I think that it's going to be changed. I think some, some better language should appear. Uh, what Java is missing right now is basically the features of the platform. So the language itself is, itself is strong, but is good enough. But uh, the feature, the, the platform itself, lacks a lot of features which are required right now for the modern development. There are many of them. I have on my blog uh, an article which I posted two years ago, and uh, it's one of the first articles. You can find it there. Just scroll down to the full list, and you will see. It's, it's, a, it's an article, a short a description of features which I think should exist in the future language. And uh, they basically, I mentioned there everything which I would like to see in the language of the future. None of them exist in Java. Well, some of them, very few of them exist in Java, but most of them, we just don't have them. So take a look at the article, and you can see what I, I think. So guys, we're running out of time. Uh, let me select one more question, and we are done. Uh, shouldn't. Uh, I don't like magic numbers. Static final variables are fine. I hope. Yeah, that's uh, static final. Static final variables uh, are not really like fine. They should be used like carefully, but they are not. I don't think they're against the OP principles. It's just. It's just. Yeah. It's just a way to avoid uh, magic numbers and to to give more semantic to constants. So if you have number fifteen, then it's probably better to explain what 15 means and uh, uh, placing the comment right above the, the number 15 is not really 
it's not really maintainable because you can lose this comment in the future. So it's better to make it a, a constant. Making it public, well, the private constant, it's perfect. But for making the, the constant public, it's actually not ideal because in this case, you um, create a dependency between some, some place where the constant is defined and the places which use this constant, which is this dependency is not really a sign of, of a perfect design. But it's not as bad as static, public static methods. So I think that's it. Thanks for your questions. I will try to make uh, a video. I'll, I'll try to put this on YouTube. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next month. The next webinar will be in a month. I will announce it on the blog. If you have any comments, you can email me after. I'll be glad to answer by email, or you can post a, a comment on the, the blog post. I'm trying to answer all the comments. Thank you all. Enjoy your day.